Hi, this is uh, Kevin Trainer. Welcome to my lecture on understanding the use cases for functions. Uh, I'm recording this in the spring of 2022 for my IS430 course at the iSchool at Illinois. And I'm covering some uh, material that historically I've uh, covered in class, not in a recording. And uh, it kind of jams up the class. So I've decided to record this. And I, I think the flow of the class is going to go better. OK, so we're going to talk about uh, a couple of things. One is um, I'm just going to talk about uh, what we're trying to achieve when we're uh, creating functions. And the other thing is I'm going to talk about uh, the use cases for functions. OK, so. Um, when we go to design a program with functions, uh, we're trying to do something that's uh, different from the naive approach of structuring our program, where we would put all the code into me. Uh, in our course, we've just gotten to the point where we're kind of squeezing into the size limitations for me, uh, both in terms of numbers of lines of code and also the number of ideas that are, are running around in a single uh, function. So uh, starting here in uh, chapter six, I'm going to be encouraging you to break up your uh, program code into more than one function. Not only have main, but to have other functions as well. And uh, what we do is that we uh, take the code that we would have put all into main and we we factor it out into other functions and then we use the main to be um, the orchestrating and controlling uh, function so that when you read the code in main um, it kind of reads like a children's uh, book it's a very simple story about what's going on in the program and you can read it and you can understand it it's not real long and it's pretty easy to follow. OK, now, how are we going to do that? Well, there are two approaches. One approach uh, says we're going to we're going to design and write the code uh, the right way first. OK, so maybe the idea of putting the code all into main will occur to us but we go, no, as we're writing it, we're just not going to plunk it all into main. We're going to factor it out into other, um, other uh, functions. So right from the beginning, we are going to build a multifunction uh, program. OK. Or we could already have a program that's uh, got either all or most of its code in uh, main and it, it's just not working and so we're going to refactor it okay so what's refactoring again we talked about refactoring last uh, week okay um, so in the current week I've got some more I've got uh, let's see last week let's look at that last week I gave you a link to the Martin Fowler uh, site refactoring dot uh, uh, com okay and uh, he says refactoring is a discipline a technique for restructuring an existing body of code altering its internal structure without changing its external behavior okay so we're going to if we're going to do refactoring, we're going to have existing uh, code that works. Uh, OK, we run a test, it passes the test. OK, we're just not satisfied yet. OK, and why do we want why do we want to make further improvements? Well, we want to make it more readable, more testable, uh, more maintainable, more extensible you know, more easily changed into other things. OK, so that was the reference I gave you last week. And the new reference for this week is just 
uh, the Wikipedia article on refactoring, uh, code refactoring. Okay, and this is looking a little small, so let's see if we can make it bigger. Yeah, it looks a little bit bigger. Um, and it gives a similar a definition, and it points to a lot of things. It points to some other um, resources, and it's got a good link to, um, it's got a good link to uh, Martin Fowler. And there's a picture of Martin Fowler. Okay. Um, uh, good. Okay. So uh, now, so one way to learn about how to factor your code is to take a code that's that's uh, that's all crammed into me or doesn't make good use of uh, functions, okay, and uh, change it, refactor it, so that you have a higher quality program when we're done. And I'm really going to emphasize refactoring in this uh, teaching of the course, okay? So uh, refactoring is uh, changing a program that's already been written to make it more readable, testable, or maintainable without changing its a function. So for us, we haven't learned any automated testing yet. We're doing all of our testing by inspection, right? So we're gonna, we have our code, we're gonna run it, we're gonna test it by inspection, we're gonna see that we're satisfied that it meets uh, the results that we predicted, right? Um, and then we're going to make improvements. Oh, okay, and we'll see the different kind of improvements that we can make. I I just like to point out here that you don't have to wait till things have already gone wrong uh, to follow the good practices that we're going to learn here. You can do it from the beginning, and I call that factoring. That's organizing your code as you write it so that it's easy to read, easy to test, and easy to maintain, and there, then less need for refactoring, okay? And I call that factoring, but nobody else does. Okay, what is uh, factoring? Uh, kind of refactoring before the fact, <laughs> okay? Uh, now, in addition to not having uh, too much code all in one place, there, is, uh, there are a couple of principles about what we should have in a function that have served programmers well for over 50 years. And that is, you want functions that have high cohesion and low coupling. Okay, and uh, cohesion and coupling are uh, computer science uh, terms that were, uh, oh, they were coined about 50 years ago, maybe 55, uh, something like that. And here's what we mean by uh, cohesion. All the code in the function is about the same thing. Okay, so when you look at the function, um, you can say, you can pick something that the function does, and everything that function is about doing that. Okay, it's not about thing one and thing two and three, th thing th three and thing four, it's about one thing. Now, you might think, now Kevin, didn't you say that main, that the main was going to do this orchestrating, and isn't it going to have uh, calls to all the sub functions, and isn't that doing two or three or four things? And I'm going to say, oh, it's really doing one thing, it's orchestrating the program. Okay, so you need to have a credible reason why you can say that all the code in the function is about the same thing, okay? You can, you can make a claim, well, this is all about this. That's high cohesion, okay? The more other extraneous things that you bring in, the, the lower the cohesion is. What's a coupling? Well, coupling is the extent that uh, functions kind of know about the internals of other functions. 
Uh, and uh, we're not going to emphasize that a lot, but that's the that is the other uh, uh, kind of measure of uh, uh, goodness, right? So functions should be uh, kind of all about one thing, and then other functions shouldn't know a whole lot about the details that are inside a function. They should know uh, what the interface is, how to call them, what's the name of the function, and what are the parameters you have to pass it, and what's the return value that you get back. Okay. Now, what's interesting is when we say the functions that have low uh, coupling, um, uh, that all you have to know about them is what's their interface, you know, what's the name of the function, what are the parameters that you pass in, and what's the return value that you get back. That's what people call APIs, Application Programming Interfaces. Okay, so that's what we're uh, designing. All right, but that's a little bit high level. Let's get a little bit more practical. Okay, like when we're when we're using functions okay um then what kind of role do they play you know what's the use case um what's a function going to do for us and i've come up with four uh categories they're not exhaustive and they're not exclusive right and here's what i say you know we might want to factor code out of higher level functions and into subfunctions um, where the subfunctions are going to play the following use uh, cases. The first one, the most uh, popular one I call bags of code. They're just uh, containers for code. If we've got too much uh, code in one function, either it's too long and messy or it's about multiple things, well, then we're going to assign it to subfunctions that are just going to hold the code, right? The second one is uh, something that I call reusable parts, right? We don't want to repeat ourselves. There's this really uh, popular uh phrase don't repeat yourself and the way that you remember it is dry don't repeat yourself okay and the thing is if we have some common code okay we're going to we're going to uh we're going to isolate that in its own function and instead of repeating that code throughout our program we're just going to have a call to the function we're going to reuse the code Okay, so that's a use case that I call reusable parts. We have a similar, a related kind of a use case, uh, which I call parameterized tools. And in parameterized uh, tools, yeah, we're saving repeating code, but the other thing that we're doing is we're passing in parameters um, uh, that uh, the call code kind of becomes like a tool. Okay, and I'll kind of show you what that is when I get to the example for that. Is it completely different than reusable parts? No, it's maybe just a different emphasis. And the last one I'm going to go over is this thing they call hiding places for assumptions. Um, if we have some assumption about way, the way that we're implementing the solution to a problem, okay, we don't want to spread that out over all of our code, even though we're not, we won't be repeating a lot of code. Okay, um, we want to make sure that we segregate assumptions into as few places as possible, such that if the details should change, we've only got one piece of code to change. And I say that this is even drier than reusable uh, parts. Don't repeat yourself, er. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at a bunch of examples, and I'll bring over my uh, pie charm. And what I'm going to do here, uh, at least for the first uh, group of things I'm going to show you, is I'm going to uh, take a refactoring approach. I'm going to show you a version of the program that is not using 
uh, functions uh, to solve uh, uh, the need. And then I'm going to I'm going to show you a refactored version. Okay. Now I'm going to use these same examples in my uh, tutorials for the coding assignment. And what I'm going to do when I do those, it's going to be different from what I'm doing here, is I am going to show you how to use the refactoring tools in PyCharm in order uh, to do the refactorings that we're talking about in the most automated way. OK, so the first of the use uh, cases that I had, I called bags of code. And so the first, uh, oh, by the way, you should be able to download this code from um, demonstration project to supplement Zell 3E chapter 6. Okay? So you don't have to type all this in if you want to follow along. So uh, this is 01 bags of code original. Okay, so this uh, really isn't using uh, bags of code. Okay, so this is uh, an example program where the main function is too long. Okay, is it too long? Well, it's a little too long. Um, I picked an Emily Dickinson uh, poem uh, that maybe I could have picked a longer one, right? Okay, but let's just assume maybe it's twice as long, okay? It does uh, tend to drone on, uh, okay? Um, so this is what we have. So this thing that we're looking for, it's called Bags of Code Original, and it's the before example, okay? And we just have print, 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 okay? And we're printing the poem because I could not stop for death by Emily Dickinson. And uh, we print stanza one, stanza two, stanza three, stanza four, stanza five. Before that, we print the title and the credit. Okay, and if we run it, we get this. Okay. And again, maybe I should I should pick one of her longer uh, poems. I had a challenge exercise a couple of weeks ago uh, for the class in which I picked a longer poem uh, to do. Uh, so I probably wish I would have uh, uh, picked that for this one. But you get the idea. We need to do something. And uh, it's it, it, too much to fit into main. So we need to we need to factor this out into other functions uh, such that um, we have a more readable manageable program. So I'm going to show you the read factor version. This one is called O2 bags of code to refactor and I'm going to open up that. okay. And what have we done? Well, we have taken the work of writing the poem, okay, of printing the poem, and we have broken it up into uh, parts that uh, are kind of well chosen because each of the parts does essentially one thing. Okay, so uh, the first uh, a part is write the uh, title line, which I uh, probably should have called the title line and credit. So it prints out the title and the credit, and then there's a space that comes after it. So we put the space in there too. Could we have done the space with a backslash N up here on the end of the first uh, line? Of course we could. That's just a matter of style. And then we've got... Uh, a function called write stands one. Okay, and that's going to print out stands one and the blank line after it, and then write stands a two, and then write stands a three, and then write stands a four, and then write stands a five. Okay, and uh, it's all pretty straightforward. 
Okay, and then what do, what does the main uh, become? Well, it's just a list of all the things we have to do in order to print this Emily Dickinson uh, poem. Write line, write uh, title line, write stanza one, two, three, four, five, and we're done. Okay, so main is all about orchestration and control, and each of these is about one related thing. Okay, and do they know a whole lot about each other? Uh, no, they don't. I mean, main knows that it's going to call these uh, functions, and they're going to they're going to write out the text, the text about you know one thing, uh, the title line and credit. A stanza, a stanza, a stanza, a stanza, a stanza. Uh, okay, and, and then when you look at uh, things like write stanza one, they make a lot of sense. Would it make sense to have a function uh, called write uh, a title line and stanza one? It doesn't, because it's not about one thing. Okay, it's not well divided. That's about two things. Or would it make sense to have one function called write stanza one and two, and then another one called write stanza three, four, and five? Again, it's not well uh, divided. They don't have high cohesion. They're not about the same thing. So when you really look at these uh, problems, I mean, there's some problems you can find uh, competing ways to think about how to uh, divide them into into functions that are highly uh, cohesive and are all about one thing. But when it comes to printing a poem, um, it's uh, pretty easy to figure out um, uh, how you're going to break this down. Okay? And the test for me of what gets left in, in Maine is it should read very simply like a children's uh, book, like like a very simple story. Okay? So there we have bags of code. So, you know, we're not, um, you know, we're not replacing, uh, you know, we're not trying to get rid of a, a duplicate code. We're not... Uh, trying to create a little uh, software tool. We're not trying to do any of the other things. We just had too much uh, code uh, cluttering up the main, and we refactored the program to structure it. Uh, okay. Um, now, I want to point this out. Uh, we're not saying that this is a better way to read the poem. Okay. We're saying this is a better way to print the poem when I go to print the poem, and the test of the refactoring that I have is that I print it the same way that I did before I refactored the program, okay? So we're saying that it's just as easy to read because we're printing out the exact same uh, text. So when you're reading a poem as, as a poem, okay? But if you look at the code, this is easier to read as a program. Okay, it's harder to read as a poem, but easier to read as a, as a uh, program. All right, and that's what we're looking for right here. Okay, now, could we, I mean, do we have to write it all in main and then refactor it? No, we don't. Okay, um, we're trying to show you the contrast of sort of the, the naive approach to this uh, program and a well-structured approach which um, breaks the code up into appropriate uh, functions, right? So if you do that, what would you call that? Would you call that factoring? Well, I'm going to try to, you know, to sell that term. I don't think anybody's going to buy it. It's just called a good program design practice. All right, let's look at the next one. So what was the next one? The next one was reusable parts. Dry, don't repeat yourself. Okay, so let's look at a pair of programs. That's going to be three and four that show us the don't 
repeat yourself use case with reusable uh, parts. So O3 is the original. Okay. So this, instead of being a poem, it is a song. It's the lyrics to the song uh, Blowing in the Wind by my old buddy Bob Dylan, who I am a fan of, was a big fan of when I was a younger man. And again, could I pick the longer song? I probably could have, but I kind of like uh, blowing in the wind. In terms of, of the sheer quantity of lines here, is it too long because of the quantity of lines? One could argue it's not quite long enough to have to break up, okay? But I didn't want you to be working on this forever, so I picked a, a manageable song, okay? So, uh, this is uh, an example, a program where the main function contains duplicate code and is too long. Duplicate code. Interesting. Some of the lyrics repeat. So there's this thing called a refrain. So at the end of each... Um, verse there is the answer my friend is blowing in the wind the answer is blowing in the wind okay now uh and we, so we have it at the end of uh, verse one and we have it again at the end of verse two and we have it again at the end of verse uh, three so from a programming perspective this is wasteful okay um, it's more code to write, it's more code to test, it's more to code to maintain. Like, let's say that we came to realize that it shouldn't really be blowing, it should be blowing. Okay, well, you'd have to change that in three places. Okay, so we don't want to do that. We, we don't want to repeat ourselves. So we'd like to get rid of those. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to refactor this and we're going to accomplish two things. One is we're going to put it in, we're going to use a kind of bags of code use case. We're going to break this up into verses. But then when we get to the verses, we're going to make sure that we don't have all three of the verses contain this uh, code. We're going to factor that code out and we're going to call it from each of, of the verses. Okay. Um, all right. And so again, let's see what the song looks like. It looks like uh, this. And you can see the refrain here. Now, it was interesting. I was uh, working on this and I was saying, is this a refrain or a chorus? So I did a little research and it said it was a chorus. And then... Um, there was a kind of version of this where I was thinking that, uh, you know, the refrain wasn't part of the verse. But this uh, formatting of the song uh, comes from uh, uh, BobDylan.com, uh, and it's from his own site. So this is, this is how he thinks that the text should be grouped, because this is how it looks on his own website. Okay. All right, let's refactor it, okay? So we're going to 04 reusable parts refactored. All right, and um, this is looking pretty uh, similar, okay? So again, we have the main that's going to call the parts. Uh, here I call it uh, write title and credits. Write verse 1, write verse 2, write verse 3. So if you look at right uh, title and credits, um, um, oh, and then while I'm thinking about it, I want to mention uh, one more thing. Um, I see versions of this where there's no verb to start the name of the function. Okay, functions hold action. Okay, so should this be called title and credits? Should this be called verse one? Should this be called uh, refrain? 
Should this be called verse uh, two? No, I think that the better name has an action word. So write title and credits. Uh, write verse one. Write refrain. So uh, so we break it down. We've got uh, write uh, uh, title and credits. Write verse one. Okay. Right refrain gets called from right verse one so that we don't repeat the the common uh, code. Okay, so that's here. Okay, and then right verse two uh, has got the content in it for verse two and it includes uh, right refrain and right verse three is uh, similar. Now, some people ask me sometimes, is it a problem that we're calling refrain here, right, refrain, and yet the, the function comes before that function? No problem at all. Or is it a problem that we're calling right refrain up here and we don't really define it until later? Uh, the order of these things is mechanically in Python, uh, the order can be arbitrary, okay? Now, good programming practice would say that we organize them in kind of a hierarchy. As long as the call to main that starts the program executing comes after uh, we define, oh, I see that we made a mistake here. It's instead of right, it says RTI. But as long as the call to main comes after we define all the functions, their order is not mechanically significant uh, to Python. So it's important for us to put them in a logical, polite order where programmers who come after us can find them easily. And put them in, putting them in a kind of the order of the oh, the hierarchy of functions and how they get called is usually the best way to do this. Now, I am going to do a refactoring here. I'm going to do a refactor rename and get rid of my typo. So as you can see, I've got the, I've got the typo in the name of the function, but I've also got the typo in... Uh, in the uh, main, okay? So the best way to rename a function, and that's part of refactoring as well, um, if we find that we have an inappropriate name, we can highlight it, right click, pick refactor, rename, okay? And we're just gonna get rid of that instead of RTI. We're going to put right, and then we're going to click on refactor. And a lot of times when you do a refactor, it will show you what it's going to do and ask you to confirm, and you have to do, do refactor. Sometimes it does that. Other times it doesn't. Um, I don't have a rule for why that happened. But now this is properly named here and properly named up here. So I think what's kind of interesting here is, uh, you know, we did the refactoring. Uh, we've done a couple of things. You know, we've taken uh, code that was in main and was maybe too long. I mean, you could argue that it wasn't uh, too long yet, but let's imagine that it was uh, uh, too long. And um, on top of that, we had repeating lines. Right? So we really did uh, two things. One is that we factored it out into reasonable uh, subparts that are each all about one thing. And then we made sure to also factor out the refrain such that we've only got one version of that code. Okay, so this is, I would say what we've done here is a combination of the use case that I call bags of code and the use case which, you know, uh, uh, bags of code would be uh, the right verse one example, and then the reusable uh, parts would be the right refrain example.
okay? And uh, there are uh, PyCharm tools uh, to help you do these refactorings. And I'm going to show that to you when I do the, uh, the uh, tutorials before the coding assignment. Okay, so that was the second one. Let's close those. And let's remind ourselves about the third one. So the third one, uh, using function as parameterized tools. Okay, so um, when you include the power of parameters, okay, it's not just a reusable part. You can actually create a little reusable tool uh, that I think has a slightly different emphasis than just reusable parts. So I'll show you what I mean here with this uh, next uh, uh, a pair of uh, programs. So we've got uh, 05 parameterized tools original and 06 the refactored one. So let's look at the original. So, oh, and by the way, okay, before this in the course, all of our doc strings have just been on a single line, okay? And if you have a relatively short uh, doc string, you know, doc string should always be the first uh, thing in the, the module, okay? And that's where we are here, okay? And if it's a single line, well then uh, you can do it like that. It turns out that these triple quoted strings are actually um, actually the syntax for a multi-line string. Okay, and so what we can do is we could actually have our text for our doc string take up more than one line and sometimes we have enough information that we do that. Um, and then uh, we can put the opening triple quotes on its own line and the closing, and this looks really nice. Or we could do this. We could put that there and we could put this up here. I don't like the way that looks, okay? So I do this, okay? But um, uh, the other version is not in uh, correct. I don't just think it doesn't look uh, look uh, that uh, pretty. Uh, so what does this program do? This uh, program uh, does uh, kind of character analytics like we were doing in uh, chapter five. Okay, so. Um, Here's what we're going to do. We have a, we have a target a bunch of text that we're going to analyze. And instead of prompting the user for it, I just uh, declared, I declared the variable in the program and I gave it a fixed uh, uh, value. So I gave it the sentence, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. Okay. And then because I'm going to search for a particular characters, I, uh, sh and they're alphabetic, I shifted it to lowercase uh, so that I don't have to look for both the lowercase and the uppercase. I can just look for the lowercase. And then here, here are the things that we're going to look for and we're going to count. So we're going to count vowels so I have a string called vowels uh, that has the value A-E-I-O-U. I have a string called uh, consonants that has all the consonants. I have a string called spaces that has a single space. And I have a string called punctuation marks that has a kind of the general punctuation that you would find in English language uh, prose, okay? And so now what I'm going to do is I, uh, I print what the target string is so the user can see it. And now what I'm going to do is I've got a bunch of code that counts the vowels and reports on them. And then I've got a bunch of code that counts the consonants and reports on them. And then the spaces and reports on them. 
and then the punctuation and reports on that. Okay, and as you can see, um, this code is similar but not the same. Okay, so uh, is it a duplicate uh, code? Not uh, technically. It's similar code. It follows a pattern, but some things change about the pattern as we go uh, from thing to thing that we're uh, uh, counting. So when we see one of these kind of general patterns, um, this is what should wake us up. What should occur to us is, what if we had a little function, a tool, that did everything that we need to do in this kind of pattern of work? What if we just did those one at a time? Okay, and so we could call that tool for the vowels, and then we could call that tools for the consonants, and then the spaces, and then the punctuations. Wouldn't this be a much more orderly program, and wouldn't it be um, uh, easier to test, easier to maintain, easier to extend? And the answer, I think, is yes. Okay. And what we would do is we create a function, okay, and we're gonna we're gonna have to pass parameters into it because we're not doing the exact same thing in each of these uh, blocks of code. We're doing something similar, so we're gonna have to pass in some parameters, and this uh, function is gonna be a tool that does uh, the job of this whole block of code. So let's look at this refactored. Okay, so um, the refactored version, uh, the beginning of, uh, so I've got uh, the doc string at the top that says that we solved it with uh, parameterized uh, tools, and this is the after example. Okay, and then I define all this stuff. Okay. And then what I do is I go right to printing the results with F strings. So these are these are exactly the results we were printing before. Okay. Except that how am I getting the count? Well, I am calling my parameterized uh, tool. So I'm calling count qualifying characters and I'm passing it the target, that's the string that we're analyzing, and whatever we're counting. So uh, when we're counting the vowels, I pass it vowels. When we're counting the consonant, I pass it consonants, and then spaces, and then punctuation marks. Okay, and what does it return? Well, it returns an integer that's just the count of all those things. Okay, so, uh, count qualifying uh, characters is just a parameterized uh, tool, okay? So um, it's got uh, a function name that's pretty descriptive, count qualifying characters. So we have, it, it's being passed two parameters, string to be analyzed and qualifying characters, okay? and it returns an overall uh, count, an overall count of uh, the characters. And it uses the same approach that we used in uh, chapter five when we were doing, um, uh, uh, character analytics and uh, 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 batch uh, character analytics. Okay, so this is the same uh, design. So we um, we set the overall count to zero. We sort of initialize the counter, okay? And because we're working with alphabetics and we don't want to look for both um, uppercase and lowercase, we sh shift the string to lowercase and then uh, then we have the loop that says for character and qualifying characters. So that's passed in, but that's going to be one of these strengths. That's going to be either the vowels or the consonant or the spaces or the punctuation marks. And then we say uh, 
this uh, character count is um, is the count for this one uh, character that we're on in the loop right here. So if we're doing AEIUU the first time through, this is the count of A's, and then the next time through, it's the count of E's, and then I's, and then O's, and then U's. And then we are accumulating these in this overall count, and we return overall count, which is the overall count of the number of occurrences of any of the qualifying characters in the string to be analyzed. And then that comes back up here, and it just becomes a number right here. Okay, and it comes out. So if you remember, if we looked at the original, which is not horrible code, okay, if we run this, um, 12 vowels, 24 consonants, 8 spaces, 1 punctuation mark. And now we're going to come here. And again, when you approach this as refactoring, when you're done and you run it, you should be able to, you should get the exact same answers. That's almost the definition of a refactoring. It works when you start. It works when you finish. Okay, so now we're going to run this. 12 vowels, 24 consonants, 8 spaces, 1 punctuation mark. Now, when you look at this code here, it's kind of interesting. Um, um, it's not shorter, right? So we look at this. Uh, well, I guess it is. This... Uh, the original program has 38 lines and well the new one has 32 that that's not a big difference right um what what i think is a difference is it would be very easy let's say that we had some group of characters that we wanted to search for um and i don't know what they would be but um uh, we had some other uh, group. Well, we could extend the program by just uh, defining them and then uh, uh, cloning one of these uh, lines. Okay. And uh, we would just have to make some changes, but we would, we would pass in a different string and we would have different uh, text out here. So in terms of the extensibility of this uh, code, when we're maintaining it over time, uh, it's much more extendable, uh, okay? And, um, and it, it doesn't repeat itself in the same way that this does, uh, okay? But uh, one of the reasons that I, I call this uh, uh, parameterize uh, tools instead of reusable uh, parts is just a very simple reusable part is not going to solve this uh, problem. Okay, you have to design a parameterized uh, tool like count qualifying uh, characters in order uh, to solve the problem of that repeated uh, code. Okay. So that is our third use case, parameterize uh, tools. And now we've got one more that we're going to talk about, and I've got two other things I'd like to show you. So the last one is called hiding places for assumptions. And I want to point out that these four use uh, cases, in any set of use uh, cases that you would have uh, for functions, they overlap. Right. So if I were to show you uh, some code and then a refactoring and I were to say um, is which of these four it is, you might say, well, it's kind of part this and it's kind of part that. I don't mean to say that these are uh, uh, distinct and exclusive, but what I want is I want one of them to catch your interest. OK. So let's look at the last one, hiding places for assumptions. Okay. 
so this is 07 hiding places and 07, 08 hiding places refactored. Okay, so we're going to try to do something pretty simple here. Okay, so we've got, we've got the doc string up here. What we're going to do is we're just going to try to format uh, a name, address, and phone numbers. That's all we're doing. Okay, so uh, we've got the name, address, and phone numbers. Uh, okay, and you could assume that I read these off of a file or I got them out of some kind of a database. Um, what I did here is I just simply uh, define them as variables because I'm doing this as an example to make a point. It doesn't have high usability because it's a demonstration. Okay. And one of the things that you'll see sometimes is there are different ways that people format phone numbers, okay? Uh, even within the U.S., um, they might group the digits the same way, but what they divide them by uh, could be different. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you how that could be different uh, before we're done. So what... What a lot of uh, systems d uh, do is that they store the number um, without, you know, hyphens or periods or parentheses. They store the number without the formatting, and they give the program uh, a programming opportunity to format the phone number the way that they would like to do it. Okay, so what's happening here is that we are printing out the name and the, the address and the, no, the, the phone numbers and we're formatting them. Okay, so if we just run this, we'll see that we've lost our thing. Oh, here it is. Okay, so let me make that a little bigger. So, uh, JNQ Scholar, street address, apartment address, city, state, zip, and then we have formatted the three phone numbers as three digits, uh, a hyphen, three digits, a hyphen, four digits. That's a customary way to do it. Okay, and this kind of looks like a good, a good idea. Like, you will have... Um, you have a lot of programmers uh, who have a uh, code like this, and I might say to them, isn't this kind of repetitive uh, code? And they go, no, it's not really repetitive. You know, we're using different numbers. And I say, well, maybe you could come up with a parameterized tool. And then they go, well, I don't think we're going to be saving a lot of code. I think this is okay. And I say... Uh, I don't think so. I think you're losing an opportunity here. And what what problem do you have here? Well, it's not too much code, right? And we're not truly repeating uh, a, a code, but you do see a repeating pattern here. It's not the same. We've got a different, you know, it says home and work and mobile. And uh, yeah, it's the same, but it's not exactly the same. Okay. Now, what's the opportunity? Let's look. Let's look at this hiding places refactor. Okay. What, what we didn't take advantage of was a way to hide the assumption about how we, how we format a phone number in one function. Okay. Why might we want to hide it? Well, it might change. Okay. Right now, we're separating the groups of digits with a hyphen. Before we're done, I'm going to show what if we made that a period. Now, that's the kind of thing that they do. You don't see that a lot, but uh, some graphic designers will put phone numbers with uh, periods in between the digit groups. You'll see them do that on like stationery or business cards or that kind of stuff. Okay. Well, if we had to change that in the old uh, program, the the original one, well, we would have to go 
uh, we'd have to go change it in three, um, I'm sorry, in two places on each of three lines of code. Okay, now this version, okay, uh, we just have a function. It's a really simple function. It's just we're returning an F string and we, what are we passing into the function? Uh, a phone number, okay, and what are we returning? A string, okay, and it's formatted by an F string, okay, and we've got three digits, three digits, four digits, okay, and we're separated by hyphens. So if we run this, okay, we get the same thing, okay, because it's a refactoring. It's the nature of refactoring that it works before you change it, and it works the same way after you change it. What you'd like about the work that you did is the readability, the testability, the maintainability, or the extensibility of your code. Okay, now let's say we show this to our user uh, community and they say, uh, Kevin, this is great, but uh, I don't want hyphens between the groups of uh, numbers. Uh, I want uh, periods. Okay, well, I can go back to one line of code and I can put a period here and I can come back to one line of code and I can put a period there and I can rerun it. And now we've got that. And I might look at that and go, yeah, you know, that's, that's kind of uh, designer trendy, but you know what? I want to go uh, kind of old school on this. And what I want is I want to just take the area code and put parentheses around it. Okay, so I want to do that. And then I want to have a space. Okay, and then I want to have a hyphen between uh, the last two. And this is the way we formatted uh, phone numbers in the US uh, for a long time. It's, uh, it's kind of old fashioned, but it would look like this. Okay, how easy is that to change? If we were trying to change this program here, we would have had to change a whole lot of code, okay? So, um, why did this work? Well, whenever you have an assumption about the way something's going to be done, and you're doing it more than once, okay? It's worth the effort to confine those assumptions to one function, okay? It, we're not really saving a lot of lines of code, okay? In terms of just counting lines of code, uh, we haven't saved any lines of code, but we've saved ourselves a lot of work um, uh, in the long run because these are just the kind of things that people are going to uh, change. So when you look at this, okay, what, what kind of a use case is this? I'm going to say that is, this is a, this a, a practice is called assumption hiding, right? So uh, the use case is hiding places for assumptions. Is it a parameterized tool? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Is it a reusable part? Yes. <laughs> okay. Is it uh, bags of code? Well, it's not simply bags of code. I, I don't think that that applies, but all three apply here. Okay. So when we're working with our code, we're looking for opportunities to um, either take a code um, that's not the best and refactor it, or if we think of it before we write it um, in an unfavorable way to begin with, we'll just write it with the good factored out uh, process uh, to begin with. So again, could you call that factoring rather than refactoring? Uh, people don't, but I think it's an interesting word. Okay, I've got two more things that I want to show you.
okay uh one is how what happens when we we design a function that returns more than one value okay let's look at this now uh this is 09 demonstrate function returns more than one value so that's what we're looking at here and i'm going to tell you that we're going to be doing some examples we're going to be doing some work in chapter nine uh, that's going to include code like this okay so i wanted to give you a early look okay so in chapter nine we learn about probabilistic functions like how can we get things to behave randomly okay and uh it turns out that there is there are a group of functions that are in a python package called random okay and one really interesting one is called rand int it gives us a random integer okay and what we're going to do here is we're going to pretend we're rolling dice so we're simulate simulating rolling dice okay and how do we do that well it turns out way down at the bottom of the code here uh, where we have a function called roll one die we're going to uh, have a call to rand int and the two parameters if this is the lowest value that we want uh, one and this is the highest six it's not one past the highest it's the highest okay so if we want to simulate rolling a die we use rantint one comma six okay uh all right so that's going to roll dice so let's run this and see how it works okay we're going to run the program and uh here's here's a roll I rolled a five and a one okay and then I'm showing uh what's the type of this thing that I just printed and it says class uh, tuple so it is a tuple it's a tuple with two elements or items in it uh they're both ints one's a five one's a one okay and then I was able to format a with an f string a friendly message that says the left die value is five and the right die value is one and if I run it again I'm going to get one and one snake eyes one and one three and two the left is three the right is two now are there really left and right uh, dice uh no they're not but I want to be able to tell them apart and because they show up in the tuple as left and right that gets me thinking of them as left and right okay and I can just keep going now how do I do this with code okay now I could have done this all in main okay uh but I would have all the assumptions in one place and I want to hide some of the assumptions okay and when we're doing this kind of code again when we get to chapter nine we're going to be simulating a pretty big dice game okay and it's going to have a lot of functions and we're going to be passing things you know down the chain up the chain and uh I'm just giving you a preview and I'm showing the mechanics of returning more than one value okay so how are we going to do this well we say that we're going to have a variable called roll result that's going to uh, hold the return value from a function called roll two dice okay roll two dice okay uh it calls roll one die two times it puts one it puts uh, the results of the first one into a variable called left die and it puts the result of the second one into a variable called right die and then it returns left die comma right die 
it returns two values. Okay, well, that's interesting. Um, now, a couple of things to remember. The thing that we're trying to really focus on here is what happens when you return more than one value? Okay, well, it creates a tuple. Okay. Uh, so what gets returned up here is a tuple with two values, okay? The, uh, uh, the first one is what we're down here we're calling left eye, and then so that's um, index 0 is going to be left eye, and index 1 is going to be right eye. So what we did was uh, we just it, it took the results of the call and we inside it we assign them to a variable called role result. When we print it, we print a tuple. Let's see that again. Okay, so when we print, oh, sorry, I, I hit it. When we print a tuple, they print out surrounded by parens. That's the convention for tuples. Okay, great. So we print it, we got a tuple, and then we print in the type of it, and it says class tuple, so it's clearly a tuple with two uh, values. And then we unpacked it into more useful variable names, okay? So we can take that tuple and unpack it into left comma right, and then we can uh, have an F string where we re refer to left and where we refer to right, okay? So uh, you can return two, three, four, five, however many values is appropriate from a function. And what you'll get in the calling code is you'll get a tuple back. And you can hold on to it and you can play with it as a tuple. Or um, a lot of times you need you know, to report on the parts or do computing with the parts uh, so you can unpack it. You can unpack a tuple the same way you can unpack a list. Okay, and when you unpack, if the number of variables you have on the left side is not equal to the number of items in the tuple or in the list, uh, if you have uh, too few or too many, you're going to you're going to get the program interrupted with an error. Uh, if you have the exact right number, well, it's going to do the unpack for you. Okay. Now, here's something I want you to think about. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. We'll talk about that in uh, class. So, why did I, why did I do, uh, why did I create a, function called roll one die okay because when you think of it roll uh, two dice is uh, kind of like a parameterized tool right we want to roll two dice and it can do two for us and we could have done all uh, this we could have just uh, taken this call to rend in and we could have copied it and we could have just put it right here okay we could have put it here and we could have put it here. Okay, and now there are really no calls to this, right? So let's put that into a, into a comment. That'll work just fine. So we can run that and that and that and that. Okay, that works fine. Why did I um, create like one more level of indirection? Well, I wanted to hide assumptions about how we roll dice. Okay, is that likely to change? It might. Okay, let's say that we're working for some kind of a lottery company. I actually did a, taught a course for a lottery company that runs the lottery uh, for states in the U.S. And um, let's say the lottery company says, well, you know, the Python random is pretty random, but it's not random enough for us. We want to write our own function, uh, you know, kind of lottery company random, okay? Well, then I have to change the code in more than one place. Whereas if I go with the version that I'm showing you now, okay, 
I've hidden the assumption about how you roll a die in one spot. So uh, if we had to change this, we might say uh, something like this. We might say uh, from uh, lottery stuff, import uh, uh, super random. Okay. Well, that can't be found. Okay. And then we would come down here and we would call a uh, super randant and we'd be done. Right. So, um, uh, one of the, one of the aspects that eh, takes a little, and again, we've got those red underlines up there because there is no lottery stuff and there is no, it, 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 so if there's no lottery stuff, then we can't find super random. Uh, but uh, a lot of times when people get started with functions, they're very uh, timid about creating functions that don't have a lot of lines of code. Okay. And they'll go like, you know, Kevin, you're replacing, you know, here we've got uh, two lines of code. Here we've got another two lines uh, 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 of code. You've got more code than you would have had before. Do you really want to do that? And I'm going to say, because of our last use case of assumption hiding, I want to do it. Okay. So let's go back to what this originally was. Right. Um, uh, I like this. You know, I'll do this all day long, even though uh, to the novice, it seems uh, kind of wasteful. But to uh, an old veteran like me, who's been programming for a long, long time, uh, we've got, uh, I just know how often uh, I've had to go back to programs because we changed an assumption that somebody forgot to hide. And I'm changing code all over the program. And it's a, it's a lot of testing. It's a lot of opportunity to make errors. All right. And there's one more thing that I want to show you. Sorry. I don't know why that doesn't want to move. There it is. Uh, I want to demonstrate the function. I want to demonstrate a function that uses a keyword parameter. Now, You've actually seen examples of keyword uh, parameters, but you're not really thinking of them as such yet, probably. Okay, so let's go to this one. I made this a little too big. Yeah, here we go. Uh, so let's uh, close this one. Let's look at the last one. Demonstrate the use of keyword parameters. So uh, most of the parameters that we pass are positional, okay? So um, the number of uh, parameters uh, that we have on the call uh, code, in the call code, we call them formal parameters, and in the calling code, we call them actual uh, parameters, right? Uh, so that's what, we, you know, that's what we've been doing, and we're expecting them to match up one for one. Okay, and they get matched up in order. Uh, what if we wanted to provide default values if we didn't pass in some uh, value? That's what keyword parameters primarily do. Okay, so um, uh, here we do, uh, here's what we're doing. Well, let's run the program first. Okay, so we say we multiplied a value of three by the default factor to get six. Well, I guess the default factor is equal to two because three by uh, times two is equal to six. And then we see then we multiplied a value of three by three to get nine. Well, that's a proper multiplication as well. Okay. So 
here's what we do. We create a function uh, called multiply it, and it's got two parameters. The first one is a normal positional uh, uh, parameter called value in. The second one is a keyword uh, parameter, okay? Uh, it says factor equal to. So it says that uh, the parameter is going to be called factor. And unless, unless the calling code provides a value for factor, it's going to default uh, to two. So up here in the top, okay, we have... Uh, we call multiply it and we only pass value okay well then uh we don't we didn't provide a keyword value for factor okay so it defaults to two so when we run the code we say value in times factor they didn't pass in a value so that's going to be two three times two is equal to six that's what we got Okay, but the second time we call it, okay, uh, we still have uh, we still have the value three, but uh, the factor we're giving a value three, so we're gonna we're gonna call multiply it, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna pass it value which is a three, and then we're gonna say factor equal the factor. We could have just put the three here we could have said uh, uh, factor equal three but I wanted to print it down here in the f string so I wanted to uh, put it in a variable uh, okay and so now we come in here the value in is is uh, three the factor is not the default because we passed in a three so we multiply three times three we get a nine we return a nine and that's what we uh, printed uh, so it turns out that there are instances of uh, keyword parameters and things that we use all the time, like, uh, oh, when we use a print to print to, to a file, we say file equal, and then we give it the name of uh, the file object. Well, that's, that's a uh, keyword uh, parameter. What happens if we don't uh, pass in a file equal uh, parameter, well, it defaults to the console. It prints to the console. So there is a default value for file, okay, that points it to the console. Okay, so this is a pretty, uh, I'd say this is kind of intermediate uh, Python, but I want you to realize that when we see uh, things like this, that they're just a pretty basic feature of Python, not one they have to use all the time, because not everything needs uh, default values. But um, we do see code uh, that has these keyword parameters, and I just want you uh, to feel that there is no magic here. Okay? They're keyword parameters because whoever wrote the function wanted to have default values. That's all that's going on. All right, I've taken long enough here. Um, in our uh, coding assignment for the week, uh, we're going to be working with the um, the uh, the tutorial examples are going to be these use uh, case uh, examples for uh, functions. And what I'm going to be showing you in the tutorials is not so much um, uh, what the refactored program looked like, because now you've already seen that. But I'm going to show you how to use the PyCharm tools um, which uh, give a lot of support for refactoring. I'm going to show you how to do that for each of these uh, four refactored examples. Okay, so I'm going to say bye until then. Bye-bye.